There were several uh, factors that weighed negatively on growth, especially towards the second half of 2018. So we've, we are projecting growth to slow from 3.6% in 2018 to 3.3% in 2019. And what's changed is the trade tensions that uh, were high, uh, especially towards the end of 2018, the needed credit tightening in China, the, the tighter monetary policy again in 2018 by major central banks. Uh, and there were country-specific uh, shocks that happened in Germany, in the auto sector, Japan, with uh, natural disasters. All of these factors have contributed to a significantly weakened outlook for 2019. How much of a probability of resolution between the U.S. and China does your forecast incorporate? At this point, our forecast has adjusted for the fact that the tariff increases that were supposed to come about uh, on March 1st did not happen. Uh, but we are... Uh, we don't have anything further in there, so, the, so if there were a resolution, and if it was a durable resolution, then that would be a plus to the forecast. Gita, your take on U.S. growth, uh, I see here that that's been, um, that's been cut for the U.S. down to 2.3% in 2019, but you've actually revised it slightly higher for next year. Why? So the cut reflects the fact that the last quarter of uh, 2018 for the U.S. was weaker than we had expected. That plus some of the negative effects of the government shutdown, but that's very slight. Uh, the positive revision for 2020 reflects the more accommodative monetary policy stance of the U.S. Federal Reserve. In terms of the more accommodative stance of monetary policy by the Federal Reserve and other banks around the world, how much is that factoring into these numbers that you've put out today? And I guess... Would you expect, especially given some of the commentary we've seen from politicians, for example, here in the U.S., would you expect that to become even more dovish or even more accommodative moving forward? I mean, we've had uh, significant accommodation by major central banks. We're talking about the U.S. Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of uh, England. So all of, all of them have moved towards, uh, you know, a more accommodative stance, and that has impacted the forecast. So... You know, the, the revival that we are expecting towards the second half of 2019 is supported to some extent by this uh, monetary, uh, you know, positive monetary stance in terms of uh, uh, softer uh, interest rates. Uh, going forward, what would happen is going to depend a lot on what the data looks like coming in. So our projections are for the global economy to recover uh, by 2020 to about 3.6%. Uh, the U.S. will continue to slow, but that is more a reflection of the waning of the fiscal stimulus. Uh, and so, you know, the U.S. economy is growing about potential. Again, depending upon the data, we're going to have to see what will happen to uh, interest rates. Yeah, you do say that if uh, the major risks materialize, that poly policymakers uh, will need to adjust. Is it your view that the central banks around the world have uh, more ammo in the cannon? Central banks have certainly benefited from an environment with uh, low inflation pressures, despite the fact that, uh, you know, the output gaps have closed or the growth is quite close to potential, uh, and which is why they've been able to take this more accommodative stance. Now, for some parts of the world, like the euro area, they're going to have to rely also on uh, unconventional monetary policy, as other major central banks uh, would have to. Uh, I mean, what we flag in there is also the need for fiscal policy to play a role uh, and that if there were a more severe downturn, there would be a good case to be made for a more synchronized fiscal expansion that, of course, is country-specific. But synchronization would help uh, the global recovery if there were a more severe downturn. Um, you'd say over the medium term, climate change and political discord in the context of rising inequality could actually become a, uh, a real threat to uh, global potential output. Can you explain exactly how that would show itself? We, we are already seeing it play out. Climate, climate risks are playing out in many parts of the world. I mean, especially for low-income countries, the, the threats are, are high. Uh, you know, most institutions around the world are paying close attention to it. Stress tests are trying to take into account uh, resilience to climate uh, shocks. So this is you know, ever near and present. Uh, and therefore, it's very important for countries to pay very close attention to, to these factors. But a point I want to make, especially for the advanced world, is that, you know, we're heading towards uh, low, moderate, and very low, modest growth, given low productivity growth, 
and given the demographics that we're seeing there in terms of aging. So if we want to see a significant reversal in, in, uh, in these numbers, we would have to see reforms that address this weakening in productivity growth, the weak productivity growth and addressing issues of, uh, of aging. Does the IMF uh, believe that uh, appointees to central banks, either in the U.S. or maybe even India, are increasingly becoming partisan? And if you do, uh, do you worry about markets doubting their commitment uh, and ability to guard against inflation? I mean, it has always been our uh, recommendation that central banks be operationally independent. Uh, that has served countries uh, very well. It has to be data dependent. Again, the word of the operation independence is really crucial to central banks, and we uh, would hope that that will continue uh, for all of the major central banks, in fact, all central banks in the world. Gita, in, in terms of uh, biggest unknowns, because there do seem to be a lot of them right now, especially as all these trade dynamics, for example, play out across the globe, I guess what are the biggest risks to your assessment that you put out today, and how should investors be thinking about that? I mean, we see uh, an escalation of trade tensions as a, an important risk. So though there has been improvement uh, on the front between the U.S. and China, uh, and a possible agreement in the near future. Uh, you know, we are worried about trade tensions escalating in other sectors, like the auto sector, and that would be particularly damaging given that it's a highly integrated uh, sector for the world with large global supply chains. So that's an important factor that we have in mind. The second is that if some of these systemic economies that we are tracking actually grow much slower than we expect, so this would include the euro area, it would look, include uh, China. Uh, and a third is with respect to financial conditions. Financial conditions in many parts of the world are, are easy at this point, but there are vulnerabilities. They're building up both in government debt, corporate sector debt, uh, private sector debt. And so in the event of a surprise tightening in these financial conditions, that could have very negative consequences for global growth.